Hello. Right then. So, um, hello, folks. For me. this has arrived. See change by key speed. Um, it probably means that part six will be delayed a little bit, but well, I'll record and try and record it um, tonight. And it may well be recorded after I've gone through the comments of um, the questions from Dogger Bank Battles. So, it will be done. Now, I need to move myself slightly over this way, because that will be better for the camera when the slideshow comes up. So, the fleet of the 1980s. Now, this is an interesting topic, and in, as I said, this is part five of the part seven part long patrol on the Royal Navy strategic role in the 1980s NATO. And it was a, it was a patron suggested by, uh, a patron choice suggested by Joseph Sullivan. I've got another patron choice on Thursday, the 25th of February, which is looking at the Adriatic. I think it'll come together in time. It's, it's always fun with slides. You know, you're gathering all the information together, you're dealing with all the other things, and you're hoping you're going to get it all together in time, but sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does. So, again, the defence debate, uh, what they defined in 1980 as part of Rara's NATO missions. Why is this more trustworthy than what happened post-not review? John Knott is not a bad man. He is, as I said, uh, the recurring theme through this has been uh, in the 1980s, as much as any other, uh, uh, as much as any other age, really, but more so in some ways. You have a government committed to balancing the books, and there are things they're prepared to cut, and things there aren't, and things they focus in on as the politico realities, i.e. everyone's talking about the central front, let's emphasise the central front, and we'll worry about the other stuff later. Conversely, now, in the current age, with everyone talking about the Pacific, uh, the service which probably is should be worried most is the army, although all services could be at risk for the cuts which are come, which will probably come, although I hope they don't, to deal with the COVID and paying for the and paying for COVID and paying for various other bills which have been run up. I actually don't think cuts are sensible. I especially don't think cuts are sensible now at the current times when you've got an economy which is going through transition in terms of i have a feeling covid will have accelerated quite a few a number of changes which are already going on in the economy i moving to working from home um yeah there are all sorts of courses which apparently are going to stay working from home even into next year and next academic year history lecturers like me probably will be working from home for a long while now because it reduces the risk. And if you're working from home, that's going to change industry in terms of uh, what spaces you need in terms of town centres. I know what I'd really like. I'd like my Toby Carvery to start delivering, uh, to start delivering again. It stops delivering for a few weeks. Lovely, I could get a roast dinner delivered to me without having to cook it. Which was great when my mum and sister decide that they are doing something funny that, for them, which I don't eat. I could get, I could have a choice of cooking myself or getting a roast dinner delivered. It was about fifty-fifty which way I went. I'm, I'm part Scottish and Cornish, remember? I don't like to spend money if I don't have, if I don't have to. But saying that over and again, the economy is changing. The economy is going to change. There's nothing wrong with that. Economies change all the time. 
Usually it's slow and you can absorb things easily. Sometimes it's not. And a good trick for governments when an economy is going for a rapid transition is to invest in defence and infrastructure. Why? Because infrastructure tends to provide quite a large amount of employment and boost other economies going on. And the fence tends to provide a lot of work for high technology and science and research. And if you have those uh, areas covered, you can tend to, keep, uh, tend to keep the rest chugging along quite happily. In Britain's case, it also has the National Health Service, so you can start buying a whole load of pharmaceuticals if it wants to. There are lots of options, but cutting shouldn't always be the, one, the tool you reach to for it. It's a very blunt tool. But it's certainly what Not was reaching for. He was even talking about selling off HMS Invincible. And whilst after the cuts, after the announcements, he decided to reverse his decision on Fearless and Intrepid, There were other things which were a risk. So let's look at the Royal Navy in 1981. Let's look at how big they were. You have a Centaur class aircraft carrier, and for some reason, Centaur is the only class name I have not italicized. So I apologize. I have no idea why I missed that one. In 1981, she's getting a glorious refit to give her a seven and a half degree ramp so she can take Harriers because she's basically the proto-strike carrier. Then you have the Invincible class aircraft carrier, of which we list three, but let's be honest, there is one, new to service, Invincible. There is Illustrious, I missed a comma, bang blasted. And there is Ark Royal, which is laid down. Illustrious is in build. In other words, the Royal Navy in reality has one carrier available. It has four listed, but one available. HMS Bulwark is, uh, has, been re, uh, has been withdrawn from service six months earlier than intended, so there is no cover, and not is trying to sell off Invincible. Oh, okay, but this is with four carriers. Okay, just think about that. You have four vessels available and reality on your list, but actually you only have one of them actually available, because one's in build, one's just laid down, so those two don't count. And the other one is in refit. Numbers lie. Saying a nation has four carriers when they do technically on their books have four carriers. They just don't have four carriers. They only have one. And that's new into service and still dealing with quirks. There is a Type 80 to destroy HMS Bristol in build. Well, she's actually in refit at this point. Deep refit. Then there are Type 42 destroyers. If they say in build or refit, they're usually in build. Sheffield is in refit, but Glasgow is in build, Exeter's in build, and I think Cardiff is also in build, and Commentary's in build. County class destroyer. Um, they're in build refit, and Trimmers are in refit, and Glamorgan's in refit. Basically, I've used inbuild refit because there are two types of refit. There is the quick refit you can you have alongside when you get back from a a long a long deployment where you're basically restocked and parts are resupplied and maybe you go for a quick dry docking and a quick repainting, but that's about it. You're not it's nothing too major work. And there is the refit like Hermes is having, so she's certainly in build, where you are getting whole bits of metal the chunk uh, cut out of you and replaced, engines put in, those sort of things. Mm, I'm only mentioning in build refit when it's the latter. The former they can do quite quickly. It doesn't really affect availability that much. Type 22, broadsword, in build, battle axe. It's, uh, she, broadsword's in a ma major refit. She's first class, but she's having a refit already. Battle axe, it's available, brilliant, in refit. Brazen, boxer, laid down, beaver, laid down. 
My God, did we name some good B class for the bro for the Type Twenty Twos? Then we have the Amazons. We have Amazon Antelope in build refit. She's in more refit. Active in build refit. And uh, Ambuscade Arrow. I think she was under construct. I think she was more of the build than the refit. Alacrity uh, Ardent and Avenger. Yes, the attempt. Uh, the previous attempt to build a cheap and cheerful frigate. The Type 21. We now, of course, have the Type 31 coming. Hopefully, Type 31 does look a little bit more balanced in their weapons fit than Type 21, which seemed to be carrying a weapons fit from about 15 years earlier, even when it was built. The Oleander class, Type 12, making up the most of the muscle of the frigate section. We have the Batch 1, who have lost their gun, their main gun in the, in the name of getting an Ikara. Anti-submarine missile. Australian in origin. Aurora, Elulius, Galatea, Arathusa, Naid, Dairo, Leander, and Ajax. Then there's Batch 2. They lost their 4.5-inch guns for exit set. Cute. They've gone French. Cleopatra, Sirius, Phoebe, Minerva, Dane, Juno, Juno, Argonaut, and Penelope. Then there's Batch 3, aka the broad beamed Leanders, the ones which you actually can avoid puking on when you're in a, a, a big sea. Achilles, Diomede, Andromeda, Hermione, Jupiter, uh, Bacante, Polo, Cecilia, Arende, and Chibis. We have the Rosse class, which are even older than the Leanders. Yarmouth, Lowestoft, Brighton, Rosse, Londonderry, Falmouth, Berwick, Le Plymouth, and Rao. Plymouth, of course, is, I think, famously still around. Just. Salisbury class, Lincoln, reserve in a standby squadron. There's a few. Of, uh, I haven't included all the vessels in reserve on this list. Mainly because, as was shown in 1982 when they tried to activate some of them, it was interesting, but the ones which do activate it get activated. We will be talking about in part seven and uh, part part six, the next part after this. Anyway, um, then we have the amphibious force based around fearless class LPDs, fearless and intrepid, newly saved in 1981 from the Axe just. We have the Round Table class, RFA manned vessels, which exist to support the Fearless class. Sir Bedivere, Sir Galahad, Sir Gaunt, Sir Lancelot, Sir Percival, Sir Tristan. Nice ships. Mm, basically old tech, but nice ships. Uh, the logistics landing craft of the Royal... I think the RCT, I think they're um, a part of the army. Ardennes and Arakan, and then we have LCM-9s, Type uh, 14 craft, um, LCM-7s, 2 craft, um, we have Avalon class, a ramp-powered lighters, again, if I remember correctly, operated in support of the army, Avon, Bude, Clyde, Dart, Aiden, Forth, Glen, Hamble, Itchen, Kennet, London, and Medway. Yes, HMS London. Uh, technically, the ship bearing the name London at this point was an Avon class ramp powered lighter. And yes, someone would be solving, uh, sorting that out shortly. There is also an HMS London. So there's lots of London going around. At this point, which is a county class destroyer. Um, there will be a London, I think, which is a Type 22 as well. After the county, cl after the county class destroyers withdrawn. So we then have the LCPP, uh, uh, the landing craft vehicle and personnel. Um, Mark 1, 9 craft. Mark 2, 8 craft. Mark 3, 9 craft. It does sound like I'm saying Minecraft. And landing craft personnel. There are three of those still around. Then there's Mine Warfare Forces. There's HMS Abdiel. Unfortunately, not the World War II, basically a cruiser, but very, very fast. If she had still been around in 1982 and still been available, my golly, would they have found a way to use her. 
Um, technically a support ship and technically an exercise mine layer only, but of course, if you can lay mines for an exercise, you can probably lay them for a real thing. Hunt class MCMVs, Brecon, Ledbury, Catastock, Cottesmore, Brocklesby, Middleton, Chiddingford, Dalverton, and Huffworth. Then it's Atrus Wilton, a prototype coastal minesweeper slash hunter. Interesting when you consider the, re the defense today we're talking about. That is a shortage, which they are looking at getting or something more of. Ton class. Mine hunters. Uh, Biddleston, Barrington. It's, that serves the Ron they reserve. Brinton, Bronnington, Bossington, Gowington, Huniston, Inniston, Kennison, also Royal Navy Reserve, Cunnington, Royal Navy Reserve, Kirkston, Maxton, and North Nutton and Sheraton, all nice ships. And then there are minesweepers of the Ton class. Althingston, Royal Navy Reserve, Bickington, Crichton, Cookston, Gusserton, Royal Navy Reserve, Huddleston, Royal Navy Reserve, Luxton, Lowston, Royal Navy Reserve, Pollington, Sherrington, Upton, Wallings, Upton, Walk Upton, uh, Walkerton, uh, Wooton, South Southerton, Stubbington, Lewiston, Crofton, which is also Royal Navy Reserve. Yes, ships were regularly part of the Royal Navy Reserve. And they were a core part of it. It was considered a good thing because it provided a sea time and incentive for things for units to enable uh, Royal Navy Reserve Divisions to rally around. Uh, we have the Venture class, St. David and Venture, Lay class, Avalie, and Ham class, Didisham, Clinton, and Thornham. All these are sort of slowly being replaced by the Hunt class. We have a nice patrol ship, HMS Endurance. Still in service just in 1981, and yes, the Not Review is trying to get rid of her. They will change their minds after the Falklands War. Submarine Force. We have Resolution Class. Uh, replacements announced on the 15th of July 1980 for, um, to be the Bankar Class. Interestingly enough, the Resolution Class and Polaris missiles were bought as part of a section of the defense budget overall. The Vanguard Class are attributed entirely to the Royal Navy budget. So whilst the Royal Navy budget, eh, in real terms, the Royal Navy budget gets a direct, uh, uh, basically a, cu uh, a cut. Hey ho, to get what is a national asset which the Royal Navy cannot use because I don't think anyone would like the Royal Navy deciding to blast off some ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads just to flatten, I don't know, Russian submarines. Trafalgar class, uh, Trafalgar, Turbulent, and one more laid down. In fact, then none of them are in commission at this point. The Trafalgar will be commissioned in 1983. But she's still counting because she's technically seen the water. No one would actually like to take her out to sea operationally, but um, yeah, she's there. Then we have the Swiftridge class. Swiftra, Strolferen, Superb, Septat, Spartan, Splendid. I would say six more overlooked submarines you cannot get in British history than those six. They do so much work between them. And... Originally, the Astute class was supposed to be replacing them, and then there were supposed to be more boats to replace the Trafalgar class. And now the Trafalgar, the Astute class has replaced both the Swiftgers and the Trafalgars in service. Churchill class, Churchill, Conquer, and Courageous. And then there's the Valiant class, Valiant Warspite, which are technically developments of HMS Dreadnought, which is one of the first nuclear submarines. And then we have the Oberon class, their SSKs, Oberon, Odin, Orpheus, Olympus, Osiris, Onslaught, Otter, Oracle, Oslot, Otus, Opossum, Alpertune, and Oix. And the Porpoise class, Porpoise, Celion, and Waterus. Some lovely SSKs there. Now, I could start making a few jokes on the SSK subject on the operating on them, because someone honestly wrote... I'm not going to link to it, because... It'd be cruel. Someone honestly wrote the fact that Britain is building diesel electric, uh, large diesel electric unmanned, uncrewed submarines, um, undersea vehicles, because it cannot build SSKs anymore. So we can build a diesel electric uncrewed submarine. But we can't build a diesel electric crude submarine. Okay. 
I'm not sure. That, that Some people I don't think actually sometimes uh, take notes what they're writing. I can understand what they're saying. They're saying that, just like in this case, they will make four upholders eventually, and that will, you know, that that will replace all those SSKs in service because they're focusing in on nuclear submarines, and that's going to make the Britain far more effective. Because basically, Knott's idea is that surface ships in anti-submarine warfare are pointless. You've got to have more submarines and more air, more maritime patrol aircraft. The trouble is, no one actually ever funds more maritime patrol aircraft or more submarines after they cut the surface ships. See what I mean? And it's when someone makes the case, oh, well, we, we can't build SSKs. Why can't Britain build an SSK? The yards are all busy. Are you sure? Camel Eds, would you like to build a submarine? Yes, we probably could. They probably would. If you're prepared to offer enough. The question is, will they build two or three? Probably not. You probably have to all gonna order a decent class of six or seven or eight to get them interested. Or, I don't know, get the Canadians involved and possibly ask the Australians if they want to join in because the Collins class replacement is going so well. There are options. But you can't really make the case in my mind that you can build a far more complicated, uncrewed SSK but you can't build a crude SSK. Because uncrewed is cheaper in terms of crew terms, crew costs and exposure of personnel to risk. Mm, but technologically wise would seem actually slightly more of a challenge. But that's me. Um, Anyway, let's look at the equipment we have. Well, I have a found a decent picture of HMS Swiftster, which was pretty darn hard. A decent picture of HMS Swiftster is often hard to find, and it's very cute. And a picture of HMS Invincible. In the 1982. These are core ships for what the Royal Navy is trying to do around the world. You have the anti-submarine warfare, through deck cruiser, which also provides your area air defense. Now, I have to agree with John Not in that he's saying, you know, oh, this isn't much capability, so we get rid of it. I don't agree with his conclusion. If it's not enough capability, your options are to improve it or don't do any operations. If you're planning on still doing those operations, getting rid of it is not the option. Because you're just depending, you're either hoping allies will fill in the gap, or I don't know what you are. And this is not going to turn into an assassination of John Knott's character, because as I've said repeatedly, there is a logic to what he does. I don't agree with that logic, but there is a logic. It doesn't make him a bad person. It just makes him have a different perspective than me. Which is actually the same line which Keith Speed takes. Invincible, of course, famously is fitted in service with Sea Dart, and eventually we'll get Goldkeeper. Um, I think, or is it the she gets? She gets Goldkeeper. Interesting question, and this is one I often ask students who are deciding that, decidedly of the, um, we like to do computer modeling of war scenarios. Add about 5,000 tons onto the Invincible design. Don't increase island size, but increase length and beam in proportion. So they maintain the same, roughly the same proportions. Maybe they get slightly, slightly higher length to beam, yeah, length to beam ratio, but you know, roughly. 
you find then you can have space to start putting on Seawolf, which is one of the interesting things. Build Seawolf into it and build Sea Dart into it. So build in, I think usually I have them build in about three Seawolf. Three and three 40 millimeter gun sets, which are taken off ships which are going out of service. And and sometimes also ask them to build in a couple of phalanx, a couple of goalkeeper on invincible when it's invincible phalanx. If it's arc roll goalkeeper, if it's invincible. And the idea is they put in, oh, they can pick where they're going to put them. Basically, I give them the weapons fit. It turns into an absolute demon in the 1980s for not much more. And then I showed them the design studies which were done around these. And there is a design study which isn't too dissimilar to that idea. And I said, they go, why didn't they go with this? They have the yard space, the yards. It requires roughly the same crew. It has a lot more space. The answer is it was felt to look too much like a carrier. Have they looked at the Invincible class lately? And then we have the HMS Swiftjet. Swiftjet is a very cool submarine. She is laid down in 1969, launched in 1971, and commissioned in 1973. She's not decommissioned until 1992. So she serves 19 years and 21 in the water. She was bought for 37.1 million pounds. A length of 272 feet. That's 82.9 meters, so shows them what than what uh, they're still working in at this point. Um, a beam of 9.8 meters or 32 feet 2 inches and a draft of 8.5 meters or 27 feet 11 inches when she's on the surface. 116 crew. She has five 21 inch torpedo tubes and is capable of firing spearfish torpedoes, harpoon, uh, harpoon missiles, and tigerfish torpedoes. She went into refit in April 1980. It was scheduled for January 1979. But it was delayed to April 1980 because of an industrial dispute at Her Majesty's Naval Base Devonport. It was in mid-November 1981. It was supposed to be completed by mid-1982. She actually didn't return to service until 1983. And the refit had cost $85 million, i.e. more than twice what she cost to build. She was due to enter a second refit in 1992, but was decommissioned that year in order to save money. Although they claimed, uh, they did say publicly, it was due to pressure hull damage uh, suffered during sea trials. Or currents, although there have been other ones about cracks in her reactor. Which she did actually have removed in June 1992. So, it could have been cracks in the reactor. I know it wasn't damage to a pressure hull. Or it could have been just not wanting to spend the money on what was by that point an old boat. But it does actually make a good case for me that she can be launched in 1973, completed, and in service for 30, 
something million pounds, 37 million pounds. And then a refit less than a decade later ends up costing 85 million. That's defense for you. Who's gouging who? It could be the question. But the other question could be, what is that refit going to do? Is that refit fixing yeah, fixing and improving engines? Yes. Is that refit fixing and improving the computer systems and the sonar? Yes. Is it possibly checking and repairing the hull on a nuclear submarine which dives quite deep? Yes. None of these things are cheap things to do in the first place. Add in the security and qualitative premium that is usual for defense equipment because you want it to definitely work. Where, because you can't exactly bring the ship into the nearest harbor and go, Hello, Mr. Uh, Mr. Soviet Union. Uh, we are sorry we are uh, docking in the Kuala Peninsula, but um, we have a small issue with our, um, our reactor. No, that, that, that's not good. And probably would be doing a weird Russian accent like that. It just won't work well. So, you have to be sure things work. And then there is also people trying to get make what they would what they would consider a healthy profit. The rest of us might consider something else. Then there's HMS Exeter, Type Forty Two destroyer. Built another example of the uh, trying to build cheaper because if you're not building the big carriers, you don't need to build the big escorts. So we'll build the Type Forty Twos. You can see there's a line from tribal to battle to daring to county class destroyers to type 82s of destroyers taking more and more on the cruiser rolls. HMS Exeter, if the type 42s come from anywhere, I would say they come from the war emergency C classes. That's their sort of pedigree history in that they are. I'm not going to say cheap and nasty, but they are done to be as cost efficient as possible. This includes originally not fitted with close and weapon system, i.e., phalanx, not fitted with a lot of things they should have been fitted with. We have HMS Broadsolder. I know she's got slightly more famous. Um, Fellow service lady next to her, HMS Hermes, but post 1981 refit. But in fact, I think that is during the Falklands War. But HMS Broadside. And this is what happens when you have a fleet where you've gone, right then, to save money, the Type 42 will have Sea Dart. Type 22 will have Sea Wolf. Again, when I was talking about the Invincible, the theorized one, with Sea Dart and, and Sea Wolf on. Great ship. Modern, Type 45. Carries Aster 30 and Aster 15. One is area, one is point. I'm going to keep quiet on the um, quiet, uh, the fitting of the Mark 41 VLS into the 16 tubes and quad packing some of those with CAM so that you don't, can cut the Aster 30, but we'll leave that to one side. Aster 15, so you can carry more Aster 30, but we'll leave that to one side. That's a different topic. This is the Navy in the 1980s. So Hermes really is the core of the fleet, and they're getting rid of her. When it comes to out of area operations, here you see a Harrier FRS ones. They'll be have the white etc. painted over on the way down south. But this is what they look like. You can say it's a legacy of peacetime, but basically the navy is trying to make it stuff as notifiably navy as possible, so they don't get it cut. And Sea Kings, this is your core of your force. 
Harriet, the Sea Harriers, and Sea Kings. You don't have airborne early warning Sea King at this time. You do have some anti submarine warfare variants, and you have some commando transport variants. So they're involved. And now we have HMS Fearless down. in San Carlos Bay. That's a picture from Milan. Good ships. They were to be cut very early. And this is one of the interesting things about LPDs. They seem to spend, uh, almost as soon as they're in the service, someone seems to talk about cutting them. Usually the same people go, ah, well, forces can be lighter now because they have more powerful weapons. And you go, yes, but can other people buy these weapons? Yes. There are many things dictators and rogue nations are known to skimp on. Is weapons one of them? Well, so if your enemy has is moderately well armed, let's say not even with the current generation of weapons, but the previous generation of weapons, and are moderately well led, you could be having a problem. Britain got lucky in the Falklands War, arguably. It wasn't nice, we lost a lot of people, and so did the Argentinians, and should never have happened. And that, sorry, if Britain hadn't actually done as bigger cuts in the Navy as it did, it could have saved itself a lot of money. I HMS Endurance shouldn't have been cut. Talking about selling Invincible class, HMS Invincible, probably not sensible. Maybe get a couple more Type 82s. Maybe not cut so quick, so deep. All these things could have been viable. Maybe build a decent base in the Falklands before you start cutting. Even then, make sure it's actually properly supplied with personnel, because there's no point in having a ginormous base and then not having anything in it. And then there's Adrian's Arden, Type 21. So they carry Exocet. And they carry a four and a half inch gun. And they carry some 20 millimeter cannon. And they have a sea cat. It's lovely. Just don't be there. Um, HMS album, of course, is actually. Um, sunk on 22nd of May, 1982, by Argentine aircraft. Unlike many of the losses in 1982, it can be put squarely at the fault of, well, it, you know, we've been over the defence plan in 1980. They have a coherent plan. Coherent plan is being implemented slowly. It wouldn't have all been implemented by 1982, but certainly a lot of it could have been implemented. But politics interfered. Because politics just want to interfere. There is nothing wrong with politics interfering. It's the joy of democracy. But it does mean you end up with this happening. The Royal Navy in the 1980s.
At this point, I'd love to say something prophetic about an enigma wrapped in a mm, then in the that sort of thing. But no, <coughs> it's not an enigma. It's not even hard to predict. It's straightforward. Political priorities meant something else was the priority, which meant if it's not the priority, we can cut it. Cuts meant that messaging, that signaling didn't have the impact that it was wanted to have. You, it's very hard to stand, stand strong and look like and go, no. No, we will not countenance this if behind you is nothing. Emperor's new clothes scenario. Oh well. So, hope you enjoyed these videos. As I said, next one will be a little bit delayed, but um, I'll go through the questions and that will probably come before the questions from the Dogger Bank. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Take care. And remember, if you like the videos, please do like, please subscribe. Maybe press the little bell down there. Always good to press the little bell. We like the little bell. bell. And perhaps consider joining us on Discord or Patreon to have a chat. Thank you very much and take care.